Welcome to the Sufi Heart Podcast with Omid Safi, featuring teachings and stories from the wisdom of the Islamic tradition. Omid invites you to a meditation on the transformative power of love and recalling the necessity of healing our own hearts through healing the world. If you'd like to support Omid's podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Omid. Hello, this is Omid Safi. Thank you for joining us again on the Sufi Heart Podcast. Um, we are about to start a two-part series on what it would be like to share a fireside chat with Rumi. Uh, Rumi, of course, is extraordinarily well known as perhaps the greatest of the Muslim mystics. Uh, as an extraordinary beacon of love, his Masnavi uh, is widely considered to be one of the zenith points of spirituality from this tradition. And he also has an extraordinary book uh, that he calls the Divan Shams or Divan Kabir, which is a collection of love poetry inspired by his beloved teacher, Shams of Tabriz. But there are also lesser well-known books of Rumi, uh, including a beautiful little prose text called Fihi Ma Fihi, uh, which means in it is what's in it. Uh, it's a collection of more or less uh, fireside chats uh, where Rumi's students and friends would ask him a question and he would respond with a discourse. So I've put together two podcasts on uh, this particular book. And in part one, um, we're going to be listening to some of his teachings. So please join us on this newest program of the Sufi Heart podcast. Thank you. So we are going through one of Rumi's uh, texts here. He has a number of different texts, and you know we're going to look at the Masnavi, right, the masterpiece, the Divan Shams, which is his collection of love poetry, and this is his major prose text. Um, and the way to think of it is that these are his fireside chats. This is uh, the Fihi Ma Fihi is the title that's uh, given to it. Uh, fihi means in it. Ma, in Arabic, uh, what, uh, fihi, uh, in it. So quite literally, uh, so what's in it? In it is what's in it. Um, Molana himself never intended to sit down and write a book called Fihi Ma Fihi. This is a collection of his uh, stories that his followers collected. And they are generally in form of he has an informal gathering with his disciples. Somebody asks a question, and then this is the answer that he gives them. Um, and many Sufi teachers will say things like, ask me questions, because it's actually when you ask that the divine sends the answer. And so your asking is actually part of eliciting so you are also a participant in the creation of this beauty and this world of meaning. Um, the challenge that we have is that in almost none of these fireside chats, majlises, sessions, um, do we have the original question. We just have Rumi's answer. And that's a particular challenge for us because the Sufi teachers have a great ability to tailor make their answer in a way that they can be 40 people in a room and each person might experience it as, I don't know what all these other people were doing there because this was so clearly something that I 
needed to hear at that time. And the rest of you all might have just gone home because this was just for me. Um, and that's sometimes seen as the ability of a Sufi teacher to offer what's called a sohbat, um, sohbat, mystical discourse. Um, and remember that the word sohbat, which is what's used here as well, is from the same root as to be a sahaba of the prophet, to be a companion of the prophet. So there's a suggestion that to be present in a sohbat gives you some taste, some flavor of what it would be like to have been present with the prophet. Um, when this collection is finally put together, it's given a few titles uh, in the original. Initially, it was called uh, Al-Asrar Al-Jalaliya, which is Asrar, Secrets. Jalal, whose name is Jalal? Well, yeah, and Molana himself. He's Muhammad Jalaluddin Rumi. So these are the glorious secrets. They're also Jalal's secrets, right? Um, and do also keep in mind that the word asrar or secret is also the word that the Sufis use for the innermost layer of a person's heart. So the deepest part of your heart, which is where God is revealed, is called the ser. A ser. Um, so a very common way in um, not just Sufi discourse, but general Muslim culture, when you mention the name of a great scholar, a great Sufi, or one of the sages, you might say, um, May God sanctify his innermost secret. May God sanctify her innermost heart. So these are not only the, the glorious secrets, these are also the secret heart, the deepest heart of, of Rumi. Um, the title, Fihi Ma Fihi, comes actually from an Ibn Arabi line. And remember that Ibn Arabi is really um, the only other Sufi in Islamic history that you could compare to Molana in terms of the impact that he has had far and wide. Um, very different flavor, much more metaphysical, um, writing in Arabic as opposed to writing in Persian, but equally influential. And so there's a line of Ibn Arabi um, that comes in his masterpiece, uh, Futuhat Makiya, um, Kitabun Fihi Ma Fihi, Badi'un Fi Ma'anihi, Ida Ayenta Ma Fihi, Ra'ayta Durru Yahwihi. Um, this is a book. In it is what's in it. Badi'un fi ma'anihi. It is new and novel in the inner meanings that it has. Ida ayanta ma fihi. If you were to look inside what's in it, uh, you would see a unique pearl of wisdom. So the fact that a phrase, fihi ma fihi, in it is what's in it, from Ibn Arabi is given by Rumi's circle to the fireside chats of Rumi is a clear indication that even if Rumi himself didn't know Ibn Arabi, his students did. So one of the really interesting developments of Rumi's lineage is that from a very early time period, the metaphysical Arabic legacy of Ibn Arabi and the ecstatic poetry of Rumi in Persian begin to merge together to the point that people are almost no longer willing or interested in distinguishing Ibn Arabi from Rumi. For Rumi himself, I think there's no reason to read him through Ibn Arabi. He's his own person. He has his own flavor. Um, and 
you know, I think that's the, um, the important kind of part of it. So I just want to take us through uh, some of the passages that show up in here um, that are important points for us to kind of think about. Um, he starts on page two, and there's two translations of the Fihi Mafihi. Uh, we're using the one by Thaxton, great Harvard professor of Persian, but also Arabic, Syriac, Kurdish, Aramaic, lots of other languages. One of these um, geniuses that just spoke many, many languages. Interestingly enough, uh, um, uh, a scholar from South Carolina, uh, when he would speak English, uh, huge, rich Southern drawl, and then he would switch to Persian, and the Persian is like um, immaculate. And um, he's translated many uh, works of Persian, including works of Mughal history from South Asia. Really difficult, difficult works. Um, so we're going to start by taking a look at um, page two of the Thaxton translation. There's a separate uh, Arbery translation as well. They're both quite good. Um, here and there, I might disagree with like one phrase that they've done. There's a couple of typos in the book, which are actually sort of significant to, to point out. Um, but on page two, you got this phrase, the sun turns ordinary stones into rubies and cornelians. Um, so this is one of Rumi's favorite metaphors, and he uses this again and again in his poetry. Um, we even have a sense of this when we talk about jewels as being precious stones. There's ordinary stones and there's precious stones. And in Rumi's time period, the understanding of jewels is that they're everyday gems, everyday stones that have been held up to the light. And they have absorbed so much light that they've become illuminated. So a ruby, an emerald, a carnelian, that these are just ordinary stones that have become transformed, that have become illuminated. But when you read something in here that says the sun turns ordinary stones into rubies, why is that a particularly apropos metaphor for Rumi himself? Who is his teacher? Shams. And Shams means sun. So almost everywhere that Rumi talks about the sun, it's at least an indirect reference to his own teacher. He's saying, I used to just be an ordinary stone. I used to be a very common stone of the kind that you would find on the street anywhere. But the light of God through Shams has been shining on me. And that's what's transformed me. Right? Uh, this is one of his favorite metaphors of the fact that transformation, illumination, is a possibility for everyone. Um, and it's part of the way that he looks at alchemy. So if you keep reading in that same line, um, earthen uh, mountains can be transformed through the sun into mines of copper, gold, silver, and lead. Right? So different kinds of metal, but the lead, which was seen as the lowest metal, the most base metal, the cheapest metal, could become illuminated and transformed into gold. So the whole basis of alchemy is to golden things, to illuminate things. Um, and again, in the way that a lot of the older chemistry textbooks used to talk about it, was that alchemy was the poor man's modern chemistry, or alchemy was the ancestor of, of chemistry. Um, but alchemy was actually a mystical science that operated from the basis that all of existence is one, that life is interwoven, and that the stone 
can become a jewel, that the lead can become golden, and that the rude and crude person can become saintly. Um, you see this in uh, a really extraordinary uh, story that you have in, uh, in Rumi Circle, which is really about the concept of adab. Um, so what's adab? Have you heard of this yet? How would we translate adab? Uh, etiquette, um, manners, refinement, refinement. So this is not necessarily like manners as we would consider it, right? It's not um, to use the big fork or the little fork to eat salad. Uh, there's no book of manners in that sense. It's that it's about the refinement of the character so that you change the heart so that how you behave begins to be transformed. Um, so there's a very wonderful story that um, the same king who is named in this book, Parvane, uh, was a huge fan of Molana. And he says at one point, oh, I love me some Rumi. I would love to just hang out with him all the time if I could. It's just the riffraff around him these common, ordinary people around him that I don't like. Uh, they're rude, they're crude, they're mean, and they're ugly. Um, they have no adab at all. They have no refinement at all, no manners at all. And whatever manners they do have, it's just ugly manners. Um, now, in a medieval Muslim society, to call someone be adab, be adab, um, lacking in manners and refinement is the worst thing you could say about someone. It's like the worst insult possible to say that you're without refinement. Because this was a society in which when you spoke, it was expected that you would speak in a refined way, that your speech would be fragranced with poetry. Um, the way you would dress should have a sense of refinement and stuff that we don't tend to think about nowadays. The way you would move your hands, and the way you would move your legs and your feet would have a sense of refinement. You wouldn't just move your hands vigorously talking with your hands. When you move your hands, it should be almost like a dancer's move. Everything from how you hold your body to you move your hands and move your legs should have that sense of etiquette and refinement, but the ordinary people around Rumi didn't move like this. They didn't talk like this. They didn't behave like this. And they certainly didn't dress like this. So the king is saying, I love the refinement of character that Molana has. I just don't like the riffraff around him. And you know, the word of this gets back to Rumi and his circle. And his circle, they're just devastated. They're just brokenhearted over this because the king has called them out in the worst way possible by calling them be adab, without manners. Uh, and his followers are just devastated uh, to be publicly shamed like this. So Rumi says, okay, come with me. And they march into the king's court. Uh, and they walk in and he walk, marches right up to the king and he can do that because He's Rumi. Uh, and he goes up to them and he says, did you say about my followers that they are biadab, that they are rude, that they are crude, that they are mean, they're ugly, they have no manners at all, and that whatever manners they do have is ugly manners? And, you know, the king is not going to lie in front of Rumi. So he puts his head down and he's like, I, I did. And uh, sorry. And the followers are really excited because they feel like the, you know, smackdown is about to come. And Rumi pauses for a second and he goes, everything you said about them is true. They're rude, they're crude, they're mean, and they're ugly. They have no manners at all. And whatever manners they do have is hideous. His disciples are like, 
the heck kind of defense is that? We thought you were going to stand up for us. We thought you were going to protect us. Uh, and here's the turn. At this point, Rumi says, you see, it is true that their behavior is not refined, but that's why I took them on as my disciples. If they had come to me already being refined, I myself would have become their disciple. And because he's Rumi and he can just like make up poetry like that, he breaks into a song and that poem is a reference to this. He says, I walk around the market, the bazaar, buying fake gold coins. Everyone thinks me mad. Who would be buying fake coins? He said, but I have a secret that they don't know about. I have the gift of alchemy. I know how to take lead into gold. What he's kind of saying is, if you're thinking of setting out on the spiritual path, don't wait until you're already refined and illuminated. Come because you're broken. Come because you're ugly. Come because your behavior is terrible. Come. Just come and bring all of your brokenness, all of your vulnerability, all of your lack of refinement, because this is the refinement factory. This is the place to have that sense of refinement of the heart. You don't want to put off entering the path by thinking that, oh, I'm just not worthy. I'm not cut out for this. This is a path of refinement. And the one thing that the beloved God does not have is ugliness, is crudeness. And he even, there's a wonderful poem that he takes from Attar. If you tell me that you have nothing, bring your nothingness, because that beloved buys nothingness. It's the one thing God doesn't have is nothingness. Um, so it's actually, it's a counterintuitive kind of a story, because at first you're like, why is he calling out his own disciples by calling them rude and crude and mean and ugly? But if you sort of sit with it, it's actually an inversion. It's saying, come as you are. Come as you are with all of your weakness, all of your brokenness, all of your crudeness. Um, and this is the place to have whatever in you is unrefined, become refined, become beautiful. Um, don't be shy about, about that part of it. Um, and the analogy that he gives to it is there is a passage that he has about the prophet uh, towards the bottom of that page, that um, this is one of those interesting discussions in many spiritual paths, um, which is, where do you start with people? If you want people to grow spiritually, you kind of have two options. You can start with people by saying, let me start where you are. Egoistic, selfish, looking at yourself as unworthy. Or I can start with where we're going to get to. Let me tell you about how loving and kind and generous the divine is. And so he starts out with a story um, again, a sort of counterintuitive story of a battle of the prophet in which he has taken some prisoners. Right? That kind of also just gives you a sense of how much the context of Rumi's time period and our time period has changed. Um, 
many contemporary Muslims are very hesitant, for good reason, to ever speak about the battles of the Prophet. Right? Rumi has no qualms about bringing up battles in order to make a mystical point. So he talks about the Prophet is engaged in this battle, he's taken some prisoners, and the prisoners are sitting there shackled, and he goes up to them and he's laughing in front of them. And some of the prisoners are like, oh, maybe he is just like all the other rulers. Maybe he is just taking pleasure at having won. And the prophet says, no, no, I'm not laughing at you. I'm taking pleasure at the fact that we are going together to a rose garden that I'm going to bring you from this state of tyranny and oppression into uh, an eternal garden. So he says, uh, bottom of page two, I'm laughing because with my inner eye, I see myself forced to drag with chains and fetters a group of people out of hell's fiery furnace and black smoke into the eternal garden of heavenly paradise. And the people are bewailing and lamenting, saying, why are you taking us away from this place of perdition into that asylum? That is why I'm laughing. Um, so one approach is that you start with people where they are. You start with people who are what kind, chained, but not in physical chains, chained to their own ego. Chained in the way that they are almost powerless to resist their own urges, their own appetites. Um, the food has a huge, the desire for food has a huge power over them. I'm hungry, so your feet carry you to the cafeteria. You might have a desire for touch and for lust that arises in you and your head turns and your eyes turn. Right? You might feel like you're in bondage to your own desires. Um, and the prophet, in a way, is that liberator, the one who takes people out of the bondage of, of the ego. But to do that, to be willing to do that, it takes the people who are willing to look at their own suffering, their own brokenness, their own pain. And these are things that, in general, Muslim discourse, you very rarely find people addressing. Um, the whole question of suffering, of the way that you've been hurt in life, um, people might be willing to talk about the suffering, for example, of Imam Hussein in Karbala. But the relationship that that has to your own suffering that's one that very few people are willing to go to. Um, so Rumi takes the religious metaphors and images that are out there, and he wants you to interiorize that. So if you could take a look at page 22. bottom of 22, there's a really important passage, which, by the way, is a favorite of um, not only uh, Muslims, but also Christians. So Christians who today live in Turkey oftentimes have this phrase inscribed inside some of their churches. Um, there's a very dear friend of mine, um, Father Alberto, uh, who is a Christian priest who lives in Istanbul. And for him, this, and he's also a Rumi scholar. So a Catholic priest who's also a Rumi scholar. Um, and for him, this pa paragraph right here is his favorite teaching in all of Rumi. So what does he say? It's the story of, of um, Mary's childbirth. So keep in mind, first of all, that Mary's childbirth is described in more detail in the Quran than it is in the New Testament. It's a very detailed 
lengthy, beautiful, um, full passage that talks about Mary's experience of giving birth to Jesus. Um, there's a dear friend of mine herself, a uh, um, teacher of Rumi, who has written a beautiful essay about the way that South Asian women, Muslim women, call on the Virgin Mary at the moment of their childbirth because they see in their own experience an echo of Mary's experience. So what does Rumi do in the bottom of 52? Um, he says, and we'll just read this part together. Nothing can be undertaken until a pain, a yearning and love for a thing is awakened inside the human. I'm going to modify the language a little bit. Without pain, one's endeavor will not be easy, uh, no matter whether it be this worldly or otherworldly, commercial, regal, scholarly, astrological, or anything else. And then here's the Quranic passage. Uh, Mary did not go to the blessed tree until she experienced birth pangs in the verse of the Quran. Uh, and the pains of childbirth came upon her near the trunk of a palm tree. Everything that you see in italics is either a verse of the Quran or a hadith of the prophet. Pain brought Mary to the tree and the dry tree bore fruit. Our body is like Mary and each of us bears a Jesus. If we experience birth pains, our Jesus will be born. But if there's no pain, our Jesus will return to his origin by that hidden road whence he came and we will remain deprived. One of the themes that we're going to keep seeing in Rumi's poetry is that he says, okay, you've read the Quran. There is an Adam. There is a Noah. There is an Ibrahim. There is a Moses. There is a Jesus. There is a Mary. And there is a Muhammad. Yes, these all represent actual earthly historical people. There were people back then. And, and everyone... Every character that you encounter in the Quran also corresponds to a faculty inside you, a tendency inside you, a power inside you. So a lot of times as he's writing his poetry, he'll just stop and he'll ask you, oh, you're reading the story of Moses and the Pharaoh. Who is the Moses of your soul? Who is the Pharaoh of your soul? He asks you straight up, you know the part where the Pharaoh says, I am the Lord on high. What quality do you have that sometimes acts as if you are the Lord on high? Now, he doesn't invent this. Um, in the Shi'i tradition, particularly the Ismaili tradition, there's very much a tendency of esoteric readings of the Quran that translates it to inner qualities. What is so powerful about Molana is the way that he just flows back and forth. One minute he's talking about the earthly Mary, the other minute he's bringing it inward. Um, so our body is like Mary. Uh, I am Mary, you are Mary, we are all Mary, and we're all Jesus. Every one of us has a Mary quality and every one of us has a Jesus quality. But if you want the Jesus of your soul to actually come into this world, you can't have an epidural. You can't have birth without pain. You can't have Jesus, who in the Quran is called the Spirit of God. You can't have the Spirit of God showing up inside you unless you're willing to undergo pain and suffering. So one of the things that he says from the very beginning of this book is, if you want to grow on the path of love, you have to be willing to endure suffering. 
right? This is not a path that says, follow me and everything in life will be happy. Follow me and everything will be hunky-dory. No, there is pain in life. There's pain in existence. And there's joy. You see him again and again use um, the language of the ocean. You are a whole ocean and your experiences, your thoughts, your emotions are like waves of the ocean. Sometimes you might call this wave joy and that wave sadness. This one, oh, this is a good experience. And that one, that's a terrible experience. Can you see all of these experiences as coming from the same ocean? Can you learn to be gracious with your own experiences, including the ones that you would experience as suffering? Because the one that is sending you suffering is the same one that will send you the comfort. I think the one point to keep in mind here is remember that there's a context for this, right? He's not going up to somebody who's just lost a loved one and say, oh, congratulations, you are Mary and the Jesus of your soul is going to be born, right? There's a time for compassion. There's a time for understanding. There's a time to alleviate the suffering of others. But he's talking to you, looking back on your own life journey and your own kind of experiences. And at the very beginning of the book, he's talking about coming to terms with your own suffering. Because that's where we are. That's actually what's bringing people oftentimes to the path. The time in life when most people get serious about a spiritual quest is not a certain age. It's not that they're 20 or 25, or 30, or 40, or 50. Oftentimes, it's a serious experience of hurt. Something happens to shatter the heart open. It could be a loss of a loved one. It could be a failure. It could be a disease. It could be uh, a breakup. And that's when people sort of pause and say, like, how, how am I living? How am I making sense of all of this? Um, what is the meaning of all of this existence? And for Molana, that kind of a pain can be something that wakes you up, that awakens you. Um, and the important thing is to remember that the pain is you the one experiencing the pain is you, and the relief is also you. I think sometimes it's helpful to distinguish this kind of a teaching from um, a kind of a more superficial, um, but sometimes people might call like New Age spirituality, which is like, you know, um, the path of happiness, the path of success. Uh, if you go to many bookstores these days, there's actually a joint section, which is business and spirituality. Right? And these are the habits of successful people. Do this and this and this, and your life will be successful. You'll be rich. You'll be happy. You'll be healthy. 
um, in its extreme version, this is what we call the gospel of prosperity. Follow Jesus in this way, and God will make you rich. God will make you happy. And Rumi says, well, well that's a kind of heresy. Because you have to remember that the God of the mountaintop is also the God of the valley bottom. That the God who sends the disease is the same one who will send the healing. That the one who might send you a heartbreak is the same one that you turn to for comfort. So you look at this for yourself. You don't judge other people. You don't go up to the mother of the cancer victim and say, God sent you cancer. That's just being a jerk. <laughs> That's not being spiritual. But in terms of your own life, in terms of your own experiences, your own suffering, that's part of, can you find the thing in yourself which is like Mary? Can you find the thing in yourself which is being born through that experience? And if you welcome it, if you embrace it, if you acknowledge it, then the Jesus of your soul will be born. And if you don't, then the chance for your spirit to come into being, it will go back to where it came from. And it might be years and years again before you have a chance to have the birth, not of the Jesus child, but of the child of your spirit. Süleyman, kuş bir gün, bir gün